today's reading, I, I'm actually doing an extra paragraph in addition to the fact that the first reading is quite long because it's a paragraph and then a, an extended quote from Paul. So essentially, I, um, the readings will be a bit longer than normal today. And the reason for that is, as I was really trying to configure um, how it would make most sense, it felt strange to cut off what is really just one paragraph in the section that we'll be starting today. And I thought it would uh, be more cohesive if we just read that one more paragraph, which is essentially to look at Paul's whole analogy of the body of Christ or his metaphor. Um, so we'll read that entire section um, today, if you're okay with that. Okay, so um, let me uh, first bid you Benum Christinit, welcome. It's good to have you. <laughs> and um, let's see if I can share my screen with you and pull that up for us. Okay. So we begin with a reflection that I think is uh, very familiar to you all. Um, and I start with this today because it so resonates with the reading um, that we'll be doing from the book. So this is actually uh, hearkening back to page 12 of the book itself, uh, St. Simeon's uh, prayer. We awaken in Christ's body as Christ awakens in our bodies, and my poor hand is Christ. He enters my foot and is infinitely me. I move my hand and wonderfully my hand becomes Christ, becomes all of him, for God is indivisibly whole and seamless in his Godhood. I move my foot and at once he appears like a flash of lightning. Do my words seem blasphemous? Then open your heart to him and let yourself receive the one who is opening to you so deeply. Okay. So for those of you who are following in the book, um, uh, we're taking our reading, our first reading today, it'll span page 28 to 30. And it's in the section, uh, subsection, you are members of Christ's body, quoting from 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 27. So regardless of its origins, Paul's theology of the church as the body of Christ holds out a near perfect paradigm for understanding the Christian doctrine of deification. His theology is rooted in the historic Christ event and at the same time preserves the incarnatio continua as an ongoing corporate reality without denying or confusing the manner in which an individual participates in the divine nature. In other words, Paul's theology holds in tension the idea that each of us are members of Christ's body and thus are really and truly deified. But none of us are individually the whole of Christ's body. That can only be said of the historical Jesus who continues to be incarnate as risen Christ through his body, the church. We partake in Christ's divinity through the grace of the incarnation the mingling of divine and human natures. It is through this lens that we can properly understand Paul's theology of Christ's body, found variously throughout his epistles, but spelled out perhaps nowhere more clearly than in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 27. And I cite him here. For just as the body is one, and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. 
Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not the hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. I realize I don't have my gong, so we'll begin our meditation and I'll, I'll grab that for us to keep track. <laughs> So our second reading then um, begins on page 30. While modern English does not convey a distinction, the Greek pronoun you in verse 27 is plural, humes. Thus we might paraphrase verse 27. You people are together the body of Christ and each of you are individually members of it. Paul's language is precise. Apart from Jesus, no individual can independently or autonomously claim to be Christ. To be another Christ is to be a member of Christ's body, an extension of the one Christ in the world. Without sacrificing the absolute transcendence of God, the relationship between God and humanity in Christ can no longer be envisioned as an infinite distance or radical break, but an organic participation. Deification does not eradicate our humanity, but perfects it. Divinization does not diminish our individuality, but fulfills it. Yet there is a corporate reality to deification that Kelly touches on with regard to Paul's theology of the body. And I quote him here. For Paul, the body of Christ is the sphere of the new creation. It implies something more than a sociological metaphor, for it looks to an incorporation of his members as body subjects into the transformed body in its present vital relationship to the reality of the universe of space and time. Paul pushes Christian consciousness toward a distinctive realism in this regard. However this might be articulated, 
it goes further than any facile metaphorical application. As a body subject, I am a member of Christ's body, but Christ is not a member of my body. My unique identity can neither stand apart from that greater identity, nor make any sense without it. Nor can we accurately look on anyone or anything apart from this fuller picture. The distinctive realism to which Paul pushes Christian consciousness is to live into one's deeper identity as an altar Christus in the world. Beyond my own individuality, beyond my own distinctiveness as a nose, ear, or hand on the body of Christ, my greater, fuller, and truer identity is that of the body to which I belong, Christ. If I am an ear, it can only be an ear on the body of Christ. If a hand, it can only be as a hand on the body of Christ. The unity of Christ's body does not then eradicate my unique identity, but fulfills it and perfects it in the fullness of communion of all things. It is a unity in difference that cannot be reversed. So our closing reflection today just continues the completion of Simeon's beautiful reflection on the body and will help to make some points that I want to draw out today about the reading. So St. Simeon, the new theologian, continues this way. For if we genuinely love him, we wake up inside Christ's body, where all our body, all over, Every most hidden part of it is realized in joy as him, and he makes us utterly real. And everything that is hurt, everything that seemed to us dark, harsh, shameful, maimed, ugly, irreparably damaged, is in him transformed and recognized as whole, as lovely, and radiant in his light. He awakens as the beloved in every last part of our body. Amen. Okay. Just as we begin today, I wanna to point out something I read from Paul's letter here, just to make sure you, you get the point. Uh, this letter, this word here, in uh, Greek is the plural you, which I've transliterated there as humes. Um, it would be su essentially if it were singular, um, su. Um, what I want you to realize is that in English we can't, you know, this word for us in English doesn't have a singular and plural version, um, uh, at least at this point in our history it used to, um, but doesn't anymore. And um, and so we can often miss how a text is being directed, not realizing whether the Greek is using the singular or plural. So that is why I wanted to point out in my subsequent um, reflection that the you in this verse is plural, and thus we might paraphrase you people together. So you all are the body of Christ and each of you singular individual members of it. Um, so he's, he's talking about a corporate reality here. Um, and then again, I'll point out uh, in the uh, citation here from Anthony Kelly, um, he talks about the body of Christ as the sphere of the new creation. And I'd like to maybe touch on that a bit this morning too, um, because there's some implications there for a number of ways of understanding scripture and and some other relevant points. So let me stop the, the screen share there and let's begin with any questions for clarification or thoughts or reflections that any of you might have uh, to start us off this morning. You have the floor. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Judy. Um, my question is, um, in St. Simeon's prayer, at the end, uh, Christ awakens as the beloved in every last part of our body. But we're, let's see, you, you said we are members of Christ's body, but. Christ is not um, members of ours? Yes. Uh, yes. Right. It's right toward the end of what you read. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, in reading that prayer, I have the sense that Christ is in my body. So I'm, I'm a little confused. Does that make right. sense? Right. No, that's a great question, Judy. So what I'm trying to suggest, and then Steph and I see your hand. I'm happy to come to your question. Um, what I'm, what I'm trying to suggest and i'll say this elsewhere in the next section too in fact i think i repeat it because i'm there's a certain maybe theological anxiety around mis uh in, um miscommunicating this idea um to make the claim in terms of the idea of deification that i am god right or that you are god um comes with a certain caveat and that caveat is that our divinity our godness is not um is not a, a, essential to our nature it is something that is we are incorporated into the divine through the grace of the incarnation not something that we ourselves generate so that's the distinction say between when we say Jesus is divine and human, that divinity is of his very nature. He is God in the most literal and direct sense of that God incarnate. Deification is not claiming that you and I are God in that way um, because our divinity is derivative of his divinity, of grace, if you want to say, not self-given. Uh, we are human by nature and made divine through grace where we could say of jesus he is both of human nature and divine nature in and of himself so the reason i i say that is to say if we are talking about the body of christ as a way of speaking about our own divinity as kelly wants to really clarify there it's not just metaphor he's really speaking theologically we have to understand that from the perspective of not falling into the the wrong thinking that somehow i am independently and the, there's a technical word we use here from the latin sui generis which means in uh sui generis means self-generating or, or generating of my own nature divine that i am made divine through grace and that is the important distinction. So in that context, when I say we are members of Christ's body, what I'm saying is that our divinity is derivative of Christ's divinity, but you can't reverse that statement. So as we'll see in the next, in the next section, it, Christ can say, I am the vine, you are the branches, because the vine is what gives life to the branches. But you and I cannot say, we are the vine and Jesus is the branch or Christ is the branches is somehow we are the ones from whom that divinity is emerging and then giving it through grace through a life giving vine to another. So I want us to be clear that the beauty of deification is that as creatures with human nature, we have by grace been raised to the status of the divine. Um, whereas Christ is divine and human in perfection wedded. And that is a very different thing, uh, ultimately, because our divinity, if you want to say it crudely, depends on, on Christ's divinity and not the other way around. Does that make sense? Yes, that does. Thank you. And, and so what, so because we are dangerously in the world of moving beyond what intellectual and conceptual ideas can do for us, we have to realize that what Simeon is, is talking, is saying is 
is, is trying to express that poetically rather than dogmatically, right? So we are absolutely in a realm where intellectually there's a fuzziness here. That's to, because our language begins to fail ultimately. Um, and this is where we'll see, you know, the, what I'm trying to move us to throughout the book is the grittiness of the contemplative life, which is more content with, with the flesh and, the, and really the reality, the concrete reality of embodying Christ. That, I think, is the greater interest of the contemplative than trying to necessarily live in the world of conceptual or intellectual ideas where our language necessarily becomes a little bit dangerous, for a Christian to say, I am God, you're kind of walking on thin ice there because you, what you're saying can be so misconstrued to eradicate the doctrine of God's transcendence, ultimate transcendence. And yet we don't want to shy from that because to, to shy away from that would also um, diminish the radicalism of the incarnation. So this is why sometimes the contemplative result ends in silence rather than too many ideas because otherwise we realize we get it, we tie ourselves into it into an intellectual knot right so it is a very uh, it's a very fine line so what i'm trying to do is in the analogies i'm providing around scripture is to show how scripture consistently affirms both the transcendence of god and the divinity of humanity through the incarnation and that those two things where, you know, where, where I've said earlier, quoting uh, Panikkar, uh, you know, he says that in Christ, divinity and hum the distance between divinity and humanity um, are reduced to zero. That's a very dangerous thing to say, uh, and yet a very profoundly beautiful thing, thing to say. And so we have to try to really tease out what it is we're saying when we say that, because we're not trying to, on the other hand, let go of the Christian insistence on the, on the utter incomprehensible transcendence of God that would fly in the face of our, of, of scriptural revelation ultimately. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Stefan, I think your hand was up next and then I see Sylvia. Um, um, yeah, you, you may have answered it uh, in that last thing. Um, I was, uh, there is uh, the, the, we are part of this of the body of Christ. The Christ is um, yeah. The, we are we are part of the the whole body, which is Christ. Is what I get you were saying. But there's right. lot. That I was thinking there's also bits in Paul and in the Pauline of epistles of our, about Christ being the head, specifically the head of the body, right? And then the rest of us are the members. Uh, as if there's some sort of distinction, even within that, even within the body between Christ, who seems at times to be specifically spoken of as the head, and we are the members, we're the other parts, but we we couldn't call ourselves the head. <laughs> but do you, yes. Do you mention that bit? Sure. So what Stefan is referring to is the fact that um, I, I mentioned just before quoting this particularly poignant passage about the, the body of Christ from Paul, um, there are multiple places within the Pauline corpus or the body of his letters where he uses the, the analogy of the body of Christ. There is one instance, Colossians 1, 15 through 20, to be precise, uh, which is a beautiful Christological hymn where, uh, so uh, for those of you who want to go back to that, uh, Colossians 1, 15 through 20, again, is, is the location of that. Um, that was that hymn, that ancient Christological hymn was the subject of my doctoral dissertation. So I know a little bit about that particular passage. Um, I always say I know a lot about those six verses. And after that, everything gets fuzzy because <laughs> that's the nature of a PhD. Um, but, but the beauty of that particular um, way in which um, Colossians 1, 15 through 20 speaks about the head is indeed to relegate the status of the head uniquely to Christ. It's the only place in the New Testament or anywhere where, where that distinction is made. And so very quickly, one of the, one of the things um, that's contested around the letter to Colossians is whether or not it's actually written by Paul or written after his death by one of his disciples in the so-called Pauline school of thought. So those who were members of his way of thinking. My 
my own dissertation after a hundred pages of debate decides only slightly in favor of it not being by Paul. Um, so I'm suggesting in all likelihood that him and that letter were not actually by the hand of Paul, but written within his train of thought. And though, so what we see there is a development of the body, body analogy by somebody, a, decade or so after Paul, maybe a couple decades after Paul, who develops that theme in this unique way by relegating the status of the head to Christ. Um, that has a unique, um, there's a lot you can do with that, but the word that's used there in Greek is kephale. Um, believe it or not, we get the word capital from that in English, for example. A uh, kephale, um, uh, if you can imagine, if it wasn't an, a, a, a pH sound, it would be a P sound. So kephale sounds a lot like capital. You can hear that. So by capital, we mean the head of something, right? Uh, kephale could mean a governing body, a physical head, the leader of some organization, uh, We, the head of state. It's used in Greek the same way we would use the word head today. In this case, he literally means the head of the body, but has that other idea of a governing principle of, in this case, the church. So Christ, in this sense, as he's saying, is the governing principle whose will, whose love, whose directives govern the rest of us who are members of his body. So in a sense, one could explore, uh, I, I explored uh, the, the analogy of, uh, that we see in Colossians to apply that to using that hymn as an ecological reading in light of climate change. And that's a whole nother direction to take that. But um, that notion of Christ as head, as unique as it is, emphasizes the way in which in it, it, it becomes the will of the divine. Uh, as we die to ourselves, we, are, we awaken to the will of the divine governing us. So it isn't just my hand, my fingers that move independently. They're moving under the guidance, the control um, of the head. Right, who's telling my fingers to move. And so when we all die to ourselves, stop trying to uh, be in function independently of that governing principle, the whole body then functions in a deeper sense of uniformity. Right, mm -hmm. So there's, that's the only place we see that, but one could certainly run with that and explore multiple directions of what it means for the members of the body to submit to the governing principle of the head, which is Christ. Okay. Thanks, Stephen. Um, Sylvia, I see your hand is up. Hi, good morning. Okay, so, um, so everything, everything is God. God is imminent. God is transcendent. Mm -hmm. The Christ consciousness is from the beginning of the universe. So I want to I want to know that I'm on the right track here. So we are awakening through practice and devotion and prayer and our works and our study into the progressive conscious realization of the presence of God and Christ in everything and Christ consciousness's capacity to rise within us as us, as we let go of our small identity and open, melt into the greater unified identity of ourselves as part of Christ's body and all of everything as God, this miracle, arising imminent transcendent so and then through grace this awareness this lived in the present moment realization living knowing being arising as can come as a as a grace as a gift as an unexpected unprayed for unworked for unstudied for unification, transfiguration. And so, because 
when when you say the the distance between God and um, was somewhere in here, and then the organic unification. Only oh, let me get the right the right. Sorry, the right. Are you looking um, at today's readings? Yes. Okay. Um, right. So uh, the relationship between God and humanity and Christ can no longer be envisioned as an infinite distance or radical break, but an organic participation. Well, since God is already everything, there can be nothing but organic participation because God's already everything. So, I mean, there's no, how can there be a break if God is absolutely every molecule, every quark, every subatomic particle, every cell, there, how can there not be perpetual, continuous participation since everything already is God? Okay, and so, so what I'm feeling is that the divinization comes from our first through Christ literally creating the path for humanity to now, and this and greater, shall you achieve to become awake not to the level of Christ or as God itself in one human being, but that this process of divinization is us becoming progressively more awake and living this true identity of our uh, that Simeon s- speaks of. So I just want to clarify a couple of things. Um, that you said in terms of where the Christian sort of uh, theological tradition would come in on that. Um, So remember, first of all, we're always dealing with models, not definitions. And so the point is, you know, as we'll see at the very end of this book, we are ultimately reduced to silence around all of this because none of it is ultimately um, able to be fully conceptualized. So we're dealing in in a realm of symbol and metaphor and allegory and therefore a, a kind of groping, if you will, in the dark. But, but each tradition that comes at this question of what does divine human look like, what does mystical union look like, I think offers to the greater conversation of world religions a certain perspective um, that it holds true to. And I think one of the gifts of the co- what, what, what Christianity offers the conversation is not that every atom and quark and galaxy is all is is god what it offers the conversation is that god remains utterly and entirely transcendent above all of it so in other words there is in christianity creator and creation and there is an infinite abyss between the two um so that one cannot merely, or even, you know, if you, pardon the word, but crudely equate a quark with God or a leaf with God or a human being with God. What Christianity wants to say, and, it, and I think this is one of the most beautiful aspects of what it contributes to this conversation of, of union with the divine is that the the infinite distance between God and humanity is not something that should be mourned. Uh, to use the words of um, von Balthasar, is not a tragedy to be overcome. It is the very place from which love happens. That, in other words, love by its nature isn't love until it's given. So there has to be in the theological framework of Christianity, a subject of God's love, right? An, or one might suggest an object, but I hesitate to use that term. That there, 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 if, if God is pure love, the very act of creation is specifically born of love because what God does to use that beautiful, the idea of zimtzum from the, from the Jewish tradition, the first act of creation becomes a withdrawal of God who is everywhere into what we could call an abyss or a vacuum 
God literally, the first act of creation, according to the this beautiful Jewish mystical idea, is the first act is to withdraw. Why? Because if God is everywhere, God has to create a place that is not God, into which the other creation is now born, right? And so now you have creator and creation. In a sense, the incarnation becomes now that place from which God's utter transcendent love pours itself back into oneness, into unity with, its, with his, her beloved, which we call creation. And the very language that the New Testament uses in Philippians about that is exactly that, a pouring into, an emptying out of the kenosis. Christ emptied himself, becoming uh, a servant. Um, so the, the, the sort of gift of this metaphor or of this um, way of thinking is not to literally equate everything. That becomes pantheism. And while that is one model and certainly has its beautiful um, gifts to offer this conversation, it ultimately isn't accepted within Christianity because Christianity wants to posit what from our own framework would be an even more beautiful conception. Because the problem that we would have theologically with pantheism, which literally means God is all, is it's mechanical. As your, as your um, reflection suggested, uh, it's, it's just there, right? It's assumed and it, it can't be otherwise. What Christianity is trying to say is that union that's there is panentheistic, God in all things, not right. God is all no. things. Yeah, imminent, transcendent, right? both. That's right. And what that allows, Sylvia, is for that the unity then is born of, of an act of divine, sovereign, unconditional love by which God fills all things, becomes at the core of all things, but is not at the same time flatly equated with all things. That right. transcendent piece remains right. part of the equation. Right. No, I, I, that wasn't part of what I was talking about. Okay. I'm definitely not a pantheist. Um, okay. I, 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 I only say that because the language that you were using would suggest that. Well, uh, imminent and transcendent, meaning imminent in absolutely everything while being transcendent to absolutely everything. So the right. flame which is heat and light and combustion, all in the same. You can't separate, as you've used that example yourself many times, but the space within which the flame can arise. Right. Uh, so God would be the infinite space within which the flame arises, but right. also the heat, the fire, the... The, the light. Mm -hmm. And that usually is the analogy, I think, that helps us, for example, understand Trinity, that you don't right. have, you know, you cannot have fire without simultaneously having heat and light, right? So we have right. a nice way of thinking about how you can talk about three distinctive realities in one reality, the three in one. Again, that's still a metaphor, but it's, it helps us begin to grasp how we can actually start to conceive that. The, the one thing that I want to, you know, us to be clear about in terms of the readings that I had to offer today is the, um, the fact that for the Christian, unity is always a, a sense of unity in difference or unity in relation, that it's a relational unity, not a dissolution of individual identity into some allness by which whatever is core and essential about each of us gets eviscerated into a greater or dissipated into some greater indistinguishable whole. Again, that's a beautiful notion. We see that, um, for example, articulated beautifully in Hinduism, the whole idea of Atman and Brahman, the drop of water falling into the ocean, which you can't extract again. And that's, I think, what Hinduism offers to the conversation. What I think Christianity offers is to hold that distinction of your unique unrepeatable eternal identity, whatever that is, um, remains such and therefore remains relational on some level. There is a, an eternal otherness, even though, you know, the way that uh, 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 Kelly talks about we become, let me go back to that real quick and we'll close on that. I see we're at time. I like his idea of saying that um, we become body subjects, right? Not objects, right? 
Mm-hmm. And I think that that's a beautiful way of thinking about it. We are subjects of the body, not merely um, objects that of some something other or outside of God that God now loves. There's a subjectivity there. So. Yeah, thank you for that. I, yeah, I, I think, you know, notwithstanding the, the one concern I had about just the, the language about uh, panentheism, I think that's that's what, what it is I'm trying to say for sure. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Francis, last comment, and then we'll move to our practice for today. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, that that separateness is necessary in order us to, for us to have free will. You have to have that separation, and that and that my understanding of Christ, of the of Christianity is that separation gives us the choice to choose to reunite with the divine, but also the choice to not do so. In a sense, yes, or at least not to accept or reciprocate the relationship that the incarnation has rendered on our behalf. And that, to come back to Sylvia's point, would be, in this case, not to uh, open oneself up through prayer, meditation, you know, virtue, all of these things, you know, love, uh, to sort of remain closed off to those things. And that's where it, it stops being heady and intellectual and really becomes about how do I live into a being of love? And, and what does it, you know, what it, one can say theoretically, one has to die to oneself, but what that really looks like in a concrete relationship where there's tension and struggle and strife and injury and woundedness, how do I, on the one hand, how do I love someone through that? Right. This is the, the, that's where the rubber of intellectualism meets the road of embodied faith. <laughs> but in that comes our our profound freedom. We'll see later in the book. Uh, we're going to be reading Meister Eckert's approach to detachment as the greatest Christian virtue. More than love, he says, it's detachment. Because without detachment, we can't purely love. We cannot love purely without pure detachment. So he extols detachment from wants and desires. And as we move now, you'll see I'm beginning to try to shift us into that direction um, for our, 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 um, uh, our uh, practice for this week, which will be built a little bit on what we'll be exploring now. So let me, let us bring, let's go there. I know we're way after eight o'clock. I apologize to those of you. And by the way, um, a very warm welcome to Carol. I saw your notes and I'm, I'm glad you're with us. So welcome, <laughs> nice to have you. Okay, let me take you guys to um, to our our thing. Let's see here, our contemplative practice. Okay, for those of you who need to go, and I'm sorry for holding you. Um, this next half hour, by the way, Carol, we 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 I at the end of usually at closer to eight o'clock, I offer a practice, and then we have a few minutes for those who want to stay behind and talk about the practice from the last week, and you're welcome to join and hear us if you'd like to hear how some people embody that. So for this coming week, I wanna suggest the following. I, I want you to notice in your body two primal impulses. Desire, which is a sense, a movement toward that sensation you have, when you're, your attraction towards something. And secondly, I want you to attend to, to fear which I would define as any time you retract or try to or shy away or recoil from something. And I want you to notice how often these seemingly polar and primal experiences rise up in you. How do they manifest in your body? What do you feel when you're feeling desire? You want something, you have a goal, you want to achieve something. And what do you feel How does fear manifest in you? What does that look like? Does it come out as anger? Um, You build up a wall, you retract, you get defensive. And then I want you to begin to notice how each of these has the capacity to disrupt your ability to be present to Christ who is infinitely present to you. So um, Sylvia, what you said is perfectly preparing us in a sense for this because this is exactly what I'm looking for, right? I want you to notice in your body how both desire and fear manifest and begin to observe how when you're being uh, immersed in these or when these arise in you, how are they disrupting your ability to be present to Christ? Okay, I'll stop there for a brief moment. Any questions about that? Okay.
Okay. For those of you who then need to leave us, uh, Benham Christ in it, uh, I, I look forward to seeing you next week. I would encourage you who have the book to reread this section. It was, a, it was a long reading for, you know, as you know, much longer than we typically would have. Uh, but I thought it would, make, it would have been hard to recapture the whole trajectory if I separated out that last paragraph. So there you have it. Um, so uh, if you need to go, we'll see you next week at this time. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and post now our uh, practice from last week, and then we'll, we'll have some discussion around that. So what I asked a week ago is this, reflect on a single part of your body throughout the day for a week. Simply notice it. What does it offer the body? What does it need from the body? How does it interact with the body? And what does your own body teach you about who you are as a member of Christ's body. So obviously we're at a point in the book where, where we're really looking at that analogy of the body. <coughs> um, and so I want us reflecting not only on the body, but in it, from it, from the place of our bodiliness. So that was the, that was the, um, the challenge, the practice, and I open the floor. Kathy. Oh, sorry, Kathy. Okay, oh. there you go. You're, you're, oh, you're fine now, yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, um, this, this is quite a journey for me. Um, I chose my, my dominant hand because I focus is not one of my strong suits. So I thought if I did my dominant hand, I'm probably most conscious of using that throughout the day. Um, so for most of the week, I just kept noticing and it. And what I quickly became aware of is that though it does a lot for me, in and of itself, it can do nothing. Um, I, so this was just so valuable for, for picking up on that. And, and also it became clear that that the reason, the subconscious reason I think I chose a donor hand, it had really nothing to do with being able to focus, is because I needed to look at that dichotomy of dominance and, and the opposite of that. And so then it caused me to reflect on my life then, because I, I have struggled with those dichotomies, because I, I, I was, um, as a child, became the mom of the family when I was nine years old, um, even though I was the third oldest of six. And so very quickly, I, I learned to become a leader. I had to become a leader, and I probably had some, some natural attributes in that direction anyway. Um, but it meant I, meant I missed out on some critical developmental steps. So then I also, I also had this deficit of feeling worthless and really low self-esteem. So I've struggled with that my whole life. And, and as a professional, I, I use those dominance skills. So by the end of my profession, I was regulating 30,000 Washington State attorneys. So I had a lot of power over their, their lives, their livelihoods, because I could recommend their suspension to the state Supreme Court. I was executive secretary for a board that, that mm. was an adjudicating body that reported to the state Supreme Court. So, but that struggle did not ever abate in terms of the dominance and feeling like shit most, a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So this, this exercise really helped me viscerally come into a more profound relationship in and starting that journey of right sizing which i really appreciated but that but then it, it opened up um some other then scripture just start hitting on it like the i'm i'm in the good book club so we're studying matthew and that the scripture in which jesus um, heals the the blind and mute man um and the pharisees um then challenge him saying that he, you know he's he, it's the word you know satan is directing everything but but then the explanation of that of, about how the pharisees really were becoming scared of losing control of losing their their power if jesus truly is the messiah 
And so again, it made me really see the, the Pharisee, you know, I'm the Pharisee. Um, Cause again, it's that, that whole false self dichotomy. I, I really now truly more because of this exercise, I understand better what Thomas Keating, of course, many talk about the false self, but Keating in particular is the one that's spoken most strongly to me that, that this is what I'm dealing with. And then the scripture in um, today's office reading it from Ezekiel about um, God giving very specific instructions about how to build the ark. It's, and the, the commentator talks about, you know, it's like God's becoming, you know, the, the Ikea instructions for how to build the ark. And it's like, what is that? Um, you know, why would God do that? But, but the reflection was that God God is interested in the very minuteness of our lives. Um, and, and, and we are called to pay attention to these minutenesses as well. So again, all how everything is interacting down to the, the tiniest detail. And then the, the last thing is that last night I was listening to David White read some of his poems. And one of the poems he read was dedicated to a very good friend of his, to John Donahue, or Donahue. Mm -hmm. And he said that one of the things that, that John talked about was about um, that we each day upon awaking, we need to take a step backward. And then by that step backward, there's then just this, this opening and then just pay attention to what wants to come in. And, and, I, and on Friday, I, I had an experience, which I didn't recognize as what it was, but it's like, you know, by David talking about that, it's like, oh my gosh. And that is, is that I, I took this four-day cor free course online and then made available the audio, video, and transcript files, and so, which we could download. And I, do, I don't know anything about technology, and so... I didn't really, and so I downloaded it, but then I didn't know how to get it onto my computer. And so I put some, I was totally frustrated. So I walked away, came back the next day, tried it again. And, and then it's just like something else took over. And it's like, I, I just heard, okay, do this and then do this. And it's like, so I didn't have a clue what I was doing, but it's like, I had this inner guy just, it's like, oh my God. And, and that's, and that's, the ultimate of what I feel like I, this exercise has done for me. It's like, it's, it's bringing me into relationship that, to realize that, that God, even as an Ikea handbook is there for me in ways that I could never, ever have imagined. So, so he's in my body, my mind. He's, it was a, I felt like this was part of the invitation to, being in relationship just through being my my computer manual. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's that's a, a beautiful reflection, and it it really does warm me to know that it was able to help bring you to this 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 depth of relational connection because that's really what it's what it comes down to and it's about. And I think it's fair to say that in our own way, we all do struggle. You know, Stefan raised the issue of the of Christ as head. Uh, in that particular Colossians text. And I think that becomes very fearful to many of us because there is subtly and in our own ways, a natural fear of giving up control, right? Um, uh, and so to be able to move into that place where you can both conceive of the relationship of and how, it, how the sense of dominance has played out, but then also to be able to begin to relinquish that for something deeper and then see that you're being caught even in the minutia um, it's a beautiful exercise. Thank you for that, Kathy. Beautiful. <laughs> the body part that I focused on this week was the, the head, the brain. And what kept coming up to me was that Greek saying, know thyself. And for so long, like Kathy, I have not had a clue who I am and therefore have operated as this person that I thought I was. 
what is coming to me through these exercises, through reading the books, through sharing, through meditation, is that my power, my authority comes from God. And that has allowed me to stop demanding from people to give me power, to give me authority, to give me all of these things I need to feel that I am complete. And it's now evolving into a situation where I'm realizing that I am a pool in a stream of living water. And mm. all that I need to do is to lovingly accept this water and allow it to pass through me undiminished and unpolluted. It's not my water. My role in the movie is just to allow it to pass through unimpeded. I am so loving what is happening in this, these sessions on Saturday. God bless you. Thank you, Robert. And thanks for sharing that. It's nice. <laughs> okay, I think um, that I saw it was Margaret Mary and then Gigi. <laughs> uh, I chose the eyes. And I could never at any point separate them from my mind or my heart. Sometimes when I saw something, there was almost a, a joy because it felt good. And it was at times I'd, I'd have to watch the, some of the thinking went to judgment. And then I, I'd want to kind of slap myself for it and say, no, that's not right. But it awakened me to the fact that I'm still doing judgment. And I really, at one time, had accomplished the point of being so non judgmental that it was very comfortable to, to be in places and to be thinking instead of judging. And so I realized that I've slipped back into doing judgment of things. But the beautiful part of it all was that, uh, for example, when I sat out on the patio, it's not fixed the way it should be for spring or I like it to be because it still needs some plants and it needs things to be watered. It needs the floor of the patio to be cleaned up. And I didn't see that. I saw it, but I thought, oh yes. And now I remember why people, that I've reflected some of the places where I've been and the people say, well, this is nice. It needs, but it's okay, but and I found myself thinking, oh, now I know why they thought it was okay, but because the patio was fine for me. It provided a quiet place and I could see the plants that are growing, nothing with flowers because I kill everything with flowers. And so it just, I could see the goodness only. And when I was driving, I noticed this week that even though I went down the same road, I was seeing homes that looked like people have done more with them. They look different to me. And I thought, oh boy, I guess I haven't been here for a while. And then I realized, no, I'm looking differently. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a wholeness. And then I wondered, I thought, well, I wonder who's in those homes, what they've done, what has caused them. And then I felt sympathy for one of them where it looked like it's a house I've been watching for a long time and it seemed like they've stopped working on it. So I found mm -hmm. myself feeling compassion. Why have they had to, did they have to stop? Or was the, the virus keeping them indoors? Kind mm -hmm. of. So it brought out compassion. It also brought out some more uh, awareness of my own faults. <laughs> And, but it was, I have to say, it was a good thing to have to do all week. Yeah, good. That's one. Yeah, any, any time we move toward greater self-awareness, it's a good thing. <laughs> That's great. Beautiful reflection. Thanks, Margaret. Mary. You're Very welcome. Nice. You're welcome. Uh, I see Gigi and then Tissy. Uh, sorry, Gigi, just uh, turn, out, turn off. Oh, there you go. I'm, I'm I unmuted. You are. Ah, some years ago, I was sitting in a circle of indigenous Guatemalan 
women who had been mental health promoters during their civil war, grassroots people trained to help other people suffering a great deal. In our circle, we were asked to grasp the hand of our neighbor and to look at it, reflect on it, touch it, um, caress it, and then to invite our neighbor to tell us the story of their hand and listen carefully. And then we reversed. We offered our hand and shared the story. And when we were all finished, we felt gathered together in a body empowered by all of these beautiful hands and in a sense of the power of the unity and the beauty of the individuality and the tactileness of the whole experience. And that to me, relating to the task we were invited uh, to reflect on, uh, always stays with me, the sacredness of each part of the body and, the, and, and, and its, again, place in the body. And um, I don't know what more to say. That it's a strong experience that is with me and I have done with other groups since. Mm. It's very beautiful. I never thought about um, an exercise in which we tell the story of our hand or a particular part of the body. That's, that's a beautiful exercise. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so Tissy. I'm truly grateful for, to be here, Father Vincent and all of you. Um, since nobody else raised hand, that's why I just thought I would just use this time, this precious time. Um, my practice was to, I was thinking immediately, as you said, that I would focus on my knees as two of my sisters had both their knees replaced. And, um, you know, uh, my husband used to say that you need to take care of your knees because your sisters have <laughs> trouble uh, with the knees. But then I didn't feel so comfortable doing this and I prayed about it and I asked God, what should I focus on? And then uh, he was... Uh, directing me to my little toes, <laughs> my little toes that, and I was very grateful that I did because I was, when I do yoga and when I do my, all my activities, you know, it helps me plant deeply into the floor, into my mat. And it reminds me of the trees, the roots of the trees that stand uh, firm. But as I reflected more and more, it was directing me even further into my childhood memories uh, where um, I was um, asked, uh, approached to stand for an election and I did for the Congress party, which was, I was in India. Uh, so, uh, but then I started, I couldn't sleep uh, since I said yes to it. Uh, and I re realized um, that I couldn't sleep. I was nervous, I was anxious. I, I mean, I, I had fear, I had guilt. It's all because uh, the one who was standing against me was also my classmate. She was of communist party. And they are people of working class, uh, like those who people belong to the people who worked in the farm for my father, for example. Um, and for some reason, I felt like I'm doing some injustice to them because their voices need to be heard or something like that. I don't know, all my life I've been struggling. My journey was totally different from everybody else's. So uh, now I'm, I was thinking of them, the littlest of my toes, they are also uh, the littlest of toes to my heavenly father. Uh, and, and that's how I mean, my thoughts just went on and on and on. And I, um, and I was, uh, I'm grateful for all of us who are doing this practice becoming more aware and for you to guide us and be patient with us and to share your wisdom and knowledge so uh, humbly with us. Um, and for the awareness and non-awareness in all of us, which is, you know, we, where we are all learning to embrace ourselves at, but, and, and learning to embrace all others who are children of the same father all over the world. And there are so many who are suffering. There are so many who are starving. There are so many who need to be heard. There are so many who need to realize that they are the perfect child of God. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how does from here, all of us combined our consciousness 
can reverberate across the oceans over the, you know th throughout the globe to bring healing to all and to awaken the minds of our little ones of the little ones where i could dissolve and become nothing and i would love to be dissolve you know i would love to be nothing to make everyone become aware that they are the precious child of God. So, I, you know, this has brought me to, and that's what these exercises are helping me uh, to realize that how much less I'm aware, how aware of who we really are and what we are called to do here. Thank you so much, Father. You're, you're very welcome. To see. Um, the yeah, and this is this is what I think is uh, the beauty of being together uh, and reading a text, whatever it might be, that you know um, becomes in a sense a shared practice. You know, opens itself to a shared practice because somehow we learn from I think one another in our experiences, and we guide each other through this. And so it's. it's I'm, I'm completely overjoyed to be a part of this process with you all. It's just been uh, a beautiful thing to witness and to start to really see how, um, you know, I'm not always sure how well these practices will be received, if they'll make any sense or if they'll, if they'll be something that actually opens us to various ways. So this is um, a complete joy for me to hear the ways in which uh, some of you are sharing here about how this, these exercises are bringing you to that deeper awareness of, of the grace of the incarnation, right? It's what it's all about. So thank you for that very much. Yeah. So thank you all. Um, was there anyone else who's burning to say something before we close for the day? I always like to make sure if you're shy and hesitant that you have that last shot, jump in. I have fun there. I, I would just I'd like to uh, say that um, uh, Simeon's hymn of divine love sums it all up. You, you, you are familiar with that hymn? Uh, no, I don't know that one. I mean, different from the one I've read to you. Oh, I, I, I wasn't here. I, uh, there was a conflict. I didn't. Um, but uh, this is how it, it just, it just may be the last uh, part of it. I, I can sure. just read a little bit. Um, uh, how how every part of our body is, is a divine. And this is the way it ends. It's, it's, a, it's a long poem. Um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and in him recognized as whole, as lovely, this is the body, and radiant in his light, we awaken as the beloved in every last part of our body. Yes. That's just so, the end of it. Is that the same one you have? Rosemary, it, it is. And actually, I have that. So, so today, so first of all, thank you for um, sort of, you know, uh, reflecting that back to us. That, 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 um, poem I used to open in our opening reflection today and the second oh, half oh. was in our, our closing reflection. So it's nice to hear that even I'm though you sorry. weren't able to, no, no, no. <laughs> no, the beauty of, no, the beauty of it is that without having benefit of, her, of hearing that, it brought you to the same place. I'm actually excited to hear. It. So that's very lovely. And if you have the book, I cite that poem on page 12 of my book. 12? Yes. On page right. 12. And, and I, I joked in the past, um, because I only came across that poem about halfway through writing my book, maybe a little bit more. And I thought, well, I didn't have to write this book. I just had to write a poem. And because he pretty much says everything I'm trying to say in these few beautiful lines. But yes, so if you have an opportunity to go back and listen to this posting when it's um, when Roger manages to get that up later this week, you'll hear that we um, we began and, and ended our, our um, reading sessions with the two halves of that poem. Oh. So it's resonant there for you. Right. Thank you for that. <laughs> all right. Okay. Um, well, thank you all then for uh, for your presence here as always today. Um, in our next section, then we're going to be looking at uh, the analogy we see in John fifteen five on the vine and the branches. It's truly one of my most beautiful 
um, what I think is one of those beautiful little phrases throughout the whole of the New Testament because it says so much. So we'll begin our exploration of that. And really, as you'll see, it is coming at the same idea of Paul's analogy of the body, uh, just through a different metaphor. So we're kind of turning that diamond and looking at it from different angles. And hopefully, you know, each of us will find ways of um, moving more deeply into that unspeakable truth of union through these metaphors. So um, uh, I'm excited to look at that section with you all, and that will bring us pretty close to the end of the first chapter. Um, so I just wanted to uh, point out to Carol, um, I don't know if, uh, oh, there you see, uh, Robert posted um, our, the link there, Carol, and you could go back. We're on, I think today marks our 30th gathering. Um, and uh, so we're only through near, we're only kind of through chapter one. So as you can see, we're going at a breakneck speed, but um, we're actually have been meeting a few more times in 30 weeks because you may recall uh, shortly after my dad's passing, there were some interludes there uh, where Robert and others took over for a bit. So, but this is the 30th time that I've been with you all. And uh, I just noticed that today as I was creating the notes for it. So it's been an ex exciting journey. and. Thank you all for being on it with me. So uh, Ben and Christ in it. I look forward to seeing you guys in a week and have a lovely week. Please stay safe and stay healthy.